Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where you may as well share the trauma we subject ourselves to week after week. People love to keep animals as pets. Sometimes they want a creature far more exotic and challenging than a cat or dog. A few of these would-be pet owners have chosen to make humanity's closest relative a part of their families. These relationships didn't end very well. Today we are going to tell you the tragic story of a lonely woman and her chimpanzee that ripped somebody's face off. Keeping Chimpanzees Since humans and chimpanzees both originate from Africa, they have lived alongside each other for hundreds of thousands of years. Some of the tribes that encountered these creatures thought their similarity to humans was troubling and left them alone. Others hunted the primates for meat just like they would any food source. Europeans first became aware of the primate species during scouting missions to Angola. Many of the chimpanzees they encountered were captured and sent back to Europe. Edward Tyson, an English scientist, wanted to learn more about these animals, so he dissected a dead specimen in 1698. It became apparent that the creatures possessed an anatomy which was incredibly like humans. In the 20th century, many of the more scientifically advanced countries had a problem. They needed to know more about how humans reacted to drugs. Additionally, researchers wanted to unlock the mysteries of human behavior. Since experimenting on humans was unethical, they realized that another approach was possible. Science could advance its knowledge of humanity by experimenting on chimpanzees. In the United States, the animals were used for research starting in the 1920s, but there weren't enough of them to meet demand, so in the 1950s, the United States Air Force captured 66 chimpanzees in Africa. Most of them participated in research projects for the space program. Most of the experiments were extremely cruel and even killed several of the test subjects. Within the United States, there were very few regulations governing who could own chimpanzees. This started to change in 1973 when the Endangered Species Act was passed. It prevented anyone from bringing the animals from Africa into the United States, but it did nothing to regulate the individuals that were already in the country. This loophole allowed chimpanzee breeders to appear all over the United States. For a price, they would take a mother's children and sell them to people who wanted to own one of these exotic primates. In 2002, one woman decided to demonstrate to the New York Daily News just how easy it was to purchase a chimpanzee. She made a call to the Missouri Primate Foundation, which at the time was the largest breeder and seller of chimpanzees in the nation. Within just a few minutes, she secured the purchase of an eight-month-old specimen. Two weeks later, she was sitting in a living room with eight baby chimpanzees. She handed over $45,000 in cash and left with the infant primate of her choice. Hundreds of people all over the country have followed the same procedure. Owning chimpanzees as pets has ended very badly for many of them. A History of Attacks for the people who bring chimpanzees into their homes, the threat of violence is real. Given enough time, it is almost guaranteed to happen as well. When chimpanzees are young, they are relatively calm and playful. They can live with human families and even interact with children and pets. But their demeanor changes drastically during adolescence. Chimpanzees enter puberty somewhere between 7 and 12 years of age, and when they finally emerge into adulthood, they are very violent animals. An adult is much stronger than a human and can literally rip a person apart. Additionally, the creatures are known to have a very bad temper. In 1967, St. James Davis brought a chimpanzee named Mo to his home in California. Mo lived with St. James and his wife for decades, but in 1998 he suddenly bit a police officer. Then in 1999 he bit another woman. Mo was taken from his human family and sent to live at an animal sanctuary. The couple visited Mo regularly, but on March 3, 2005, while they were celebrating Mo's 39th birthday, two chimpanzees escaped from their cages. They attacked St. James and his wife. St. James was viciously mauled. His nose and several fingers were bitten off. One of his eyes was gouged out also. The attacking primates had to be killed to stop the attack. St. James later told a reporter about the horrific experience. I remember every bite, one at a time. I remember when I went to touch my face, my fingers looked really scary. Even those who spend their lives researching wild chimpanzees are not safe. In 2012, 
Primate researcher Andrew Oberly traveled from Texas to South Africa to examine how the animals used tools. One day, he was leading a tour of a facility that housed several chimpanzees. Two of them suddenly grabbed Andrew's legs and pulled him under the fence. They then viciously attacked him. He survived, but lost his ears, most of his fingers, his scalp, and part of his feet. Despite the danger posed by these animals, people still purchase them and try to turn them into household pets. In one case, a woman's love for her pet chimpanzee resulted in tragic consequences. Finding Travis Sandy Harold was born in 1938. She spent her entire life in Stanford, Connecticut. She married around 1957, right after leaving high school. Then she divorced and married again in 1961. The couple had a daughter named Susan, but four years later, their marriage would fall apart as well. Around 1968, Sandy met Jerry Harold. The pair became inseparable and were soon married. Sandy finally found herself in a stable relationship. The couple also became millionaires after opening a towing business and a body shop. Sandy also liked to go to rodeos. In the 1970s, while attending a rodeo event, she met a teenage runaway named Charla Nash. The two became great friends, and Charla even worked for Sandy and Jerry for a time. Sandy's daughter Susan also participated in the family business. Sandy enjoyed living with her family, but one day Susan married an employee from the family business and moved away. Sandy Harold was lonely without her daughter, so she decided that having a pet chimpanzee might make life more bearable. In 1995, she went to a breeder in Festus, Missouri. Sandy paid $50,000 and was given a baby chimpanzee, which she named Travis. She named the animal after her favorite country music artist, Travis Tritt. She then took Travis back home to Connecticut and began caring for him. Jerry and Sandy also modified their house to accommodate the primate. He had an indoor enclosure and his own room in the house. Over time, Travis also learned to live much like humans. He would use the bathroom, get food and drinks from the fridge, and he would even brush his teeth at night. What Jerry and Sandy didn't know was that Travis was a lot like his parents. In 2001, his mother and father escaped from captivity. The pair tried attacking teenagers at a nearby house, then began attacking their pet dogs. One of the teenagers grabbed a gun and killed Travis's mother. Jerry and Sandy would have several happy years with their pet primate, but Travis would turn out to be too much like his mother. Happy Days Jerry and Sandy would take Travis to work with them at the towing business each day. The employees loved him and customers were also intrigued by the chimpanzee. Travis would sit at the table with Sandy and Jerry for meals every day. He would also go to an Italian restaurant with them from time to time. His favorite dish was filet mignon. Sandy would even take Travis to the beach and carry him around like he was a child. Eventually, the pet chimpanzee became famous and started appearing on television. He was in an advertisement for Coca-Cola. Travis was even on the Maury Povich show at one point. The best years of Sandy's life came to an end when Travis was around five years old. Sandy's daughter Susan was having a problem with headaches. One fateful evening in September 2000, she took a Percocet for a migraine. Then she got in her vehicle and started driving. Susan ran off the road and hit a tree. She was killed instantly. Sandy, Jerry, and Travis became less social after Susan's death. They kept to themselves for the next few years. One night in 2003, they were watching a baseball game. After it ended, the trio decided to drive to the tow shop to check on something. As they were waiting at a traffic light, somebody threw an empty bottle into the vehicle. Travis opened his door and began chasing the offenders. Then he started rolling around in the street. Next, he started running at police officers. Travis didn't hurt anyone and finally rejoined Sandy and Jerry after letting police officers chase him for several minutes. No charges were filed. For Travis, adolescence had started, and his behavior would only get worse. A Violent End In March 2005, Jerry had to go to the hospital. His abdomen was hurting a lot, and he didn't know why. The doctors soon discovered that he had stomach cancer, and it was terminal. Jerry told Sandy that if he died, she should send Travis to a sanctuary. He said the chimpanzee would be too much for her to handle. Jerry then passed away on April 12th. 
For the next year, Sandy and Travis stayed in the house and kept each other company. At some point in 2006, she wrote a letter to a chimpanzee sanctuary. Part of the letter said, I have no family. My only child, Susan, had gotten killed in an auto accident four years before Jerry died and who Travis also loved. My grandkids live in North Carolina and I don't see them very often. I live alone with Travis. We eat and sleep together, but I am worried that if something happens to me as suddenly as my husband, what would happen to Travis? Therefore, I have to try to do something before that happens. I set up a trust fund for him, but that's not enough. He needs someone to play with of his own kind and have the best, most possible life if I'm not here to care for him. She put the letter in an envelope, but never mailed it. Sandy couldn't bring herself to let Travis go. For the next three years, Sandy and Travis continued their life of seclusion. The only visitor they saw was Charla Nash. And during this time, Travis grew into a very obese 240-pound primate. On February 16, 2009, Sandra and Charla had just returned from a trip. Travis was acting very agitated that afternoon, so Sandra put some Xanax in his tea, but it didn't improve his attitude. According to Charla, Sandy called her and said Travis was running around the yard and wouldn't come inside. She said Sandy asked for help with the disobedient chimpanzee. Charla agreed to help and appeared sometime later in the driveway. Charla knew that Travis liked Tickle Me Elmo, so she brought the doll with her. When she waved it at him, Travis responded by attacking her. He knocked her against the car, then descended upon her already bloody body. The chimpanzee began ripping her apart piece by piece. Sandy grabbed a butcher knife and ran out into the yard. She stabbed Travis three times in the back. He stopped attacking Charla, looked Sandy in the face, then returned to terrorizing his victim. Sandy jumped into her car and called the police. An officer arrived 12 minutes later. He could see Charla's body lying in the yard. Her hands were gone, her scalp was gone, even her face had been removed. Suddenly, Travis began attacking the police car. The officer removed his pistol and shot Travis four times. Travis yelled, then took off running. After being shot, he walked back into the house and went to his room. Travis made it to his bed, then died from his injuries. Charla was alive, but just barely, and Sandy was now completely and truly alone. The Legacy of Travis Sandy carried on with life and kept almost entirely to herself. She would occasionally speak to friends on the phone. When she did, she would usually cry about Travis. Sandy also spent her days feeding deer and raccoons, which was the only company she had. On May 24, 2010, she began feeling chest pains. She was taken to the hospital, where it was discovered that she needed emergency heart surgery. During the surgery, Sandy's lungs filled with blood and she passed away. When Charla was told of Sandy's death, she said, Sandra was a troubled woman, and maybe she has some peace now. Although Sandra's suffering was over, Charla Nash was just beginning her journey. On May 28, 2011, she underwent transplant surgery. Charla received two new hands and a new face. Unfortunately, she developed an infection and lost the new hands. Today, Charla is able to live independently with the assistance of AIDS. She is completely blind but passes the time by listening to audiobooks. And she isn't totally without financial resources either. Charla received several million dollars after suing Sandy's estate. Charla doesn't have any memories of the attack, but her injuries were so horrific that many of the health professionals who cared for her required extensive therapy to handle the emotional distress. Today, it is illegal to own a chimpanzee as a pet in most states, but if the required conditions can be met, it is still possible to own them in Alabama, Idaho, Kansas, and Texas. If you want to learn more about how exotic pets can turn violent, you might enjoy a previous episode we made called Killer Pets. Was Sandy responsible for Charla's suffering because of her desire to have a pet chimpanzee? Or was she just a lonely woman who made an unfortunate mistake? And did Travis deserve to die? Tell us what you think in the comments below, and if you would like to ensure that strange stories like this keep being delivered to you every week, consider doing something to help us. Like this video, or perhaps watch another one. We even have a Patreon and a PayPal donation link. 
Look in the video description for more information. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.